I've come to talk to you about addiction, the power of addiction, but also addiction to power. Now, as a medical doctor, I work in Vancouver, Canada, and I've worked with some very, very addicted people, people who use heroin, they inject uh, cocaine, uh, they drink alcohol, uh, crystal meth, and every drug known to man. And these people suffer. If the success of a doctor is to be measured by how long his patients live, then I'm a failure, because my patients die very young, relatively speaking. They die of HIV, they die of hepatitis C, they die of infections of their heart valves, they die of infections of their brains, of their spine, of their hearts, of their bloodstream. They die of suicide, of overdose, of violence, of accidental deaths. And if you look at them, you, you call to mind the words of the great Egyptian novelist Naguib Mahfouz, who wrote, nothing records the effects of a sad life as graphically as the human body, because these people lose everything. They lose their health, they lose their beauty, they lose their teeth, they lose their wealth, they lose human relationship, and in the end, they often lose their lives. And yet nothing shakes them from their addiction, nothing can force them to give up their addiction. The addictions are powerful, and the question is why. And as one of my patients said to me, I'm not afraid of dying, he said, I'm more afraid of living. And the question we have to ask is, why are people afraid of life? And if you want to understand addiction, you can't look at what's wrong with the addiction, you have to look at what's right about it. In other words, what is the person getting from the addiction? What are they getting that otherwise they don't have? And what addicts get are relief from, us, from pain. What they get is a sense of peace, a sense of control, um, a sense of calmness, very, very temporarily. And the question is, why are these qualities missing from their lives? What happened to them? Now, if you look at the drugs like heroin, like morphine, like codeine, um, if you look at uh, cocaine, if you look at alcohol, these are all painkillers. One way or another, they all soothe pain. And that's where the real question in addiction is not why the addiction, but why the pain. Now, I just finished reading the biography of Keith Richards, the guitarist for the Rolling Stones. And as you probably know, everybody's still surprised that Richards is still alive today because he was a heavy-duty heroin addict for a long time. And in his biography, he writes that the addiction was all about looking for oblivion, looking for forgetting. He said, the contortions that we go through just not to be ourselves for a few hours. And I understand that very well myself, because I know that discomfort with myself. I know that uh, discomfort being in my own skin. I know that desire to escape from my own mind. The uh, great British psychiatrist, uh, R.D. Uh, Lang said that there are three things that people are afraid of. They're afraid of death, of other people, and their own minds. And for a long time in my life, I wanted to distract myself from my own mind because I was afraid to be alone with it. And how would I distract myself? Well, I I've never used drugs, but I distracted myself through work and throwing myself into uh, activity. And I've distracted myself through shopping. Uh, in my case, for classical compact music, classical compact discs. But I've been a real addict that way. One week I spent $8,000 on the classical compact discs, not because I wanted to, but because I couldn't help going back to the store. And as a medical doctor, I used to deliver a lot of babies, and once I left a woman in labor in hospital to get a, to get a, a classical uh, piece of music. And I still could have made it back to the, store, uh, to the hospital on time, but once you're in the store, you can't leave because there is evil classical music dealers in the aisles, you know, who... Hey, buddy, have you listened to the latest Mozart symphony uh, cycle? You haven't? Well... So I missed the delivery of that baby. And I'd come home and I'd lie to my wife about it, like any addict. I would lie about it. And I would ignore my own children because of my obsession with work and with music. So I know what that escape uh, from the self is like. And my definition of addiction is any behavior that gives you temporary relief, temporary pleasure, but in the long term causes harm, has some negative consequences, and you can't give it up despite those negative consequences. 
And, and from that perspective, you can understand that uh, there's many, many addictions. Yes, there's the addiction to drugs, but there's also the addiction to consumerism. Uh, there's the addiction to uh, sex, to the internet, uh, to uh, shopping, to food. The Buddhists have this idea of the hungry ghosts. The hungry ghosts are creatures with large empty bellies and small scrawny necks and tiny little mouths, so they can never get enough. They can never feel this emptiness on the inside. And we all hungry ghosts in this society. We all have this emptiness. And so many of us are trying to uh, fill that emptiness from the outside. And the addiction is all about trying to fill that emptiness from the outside. Now, if you want to ask the question of why people are in pain, you can't look at their genetics. You have to look at their lives. And in the case of my patients, my highly addicted patients, it's very clear why they're in pain. Because they've been abused all their lives. They began life as abused children. All the women I worked with over a 12-year period, hundreds of them, they had all been sexually abused as children. And the men had been traumatized as well. The men had been sexually abused, neglected, physically abused, abandoned, and emotionally hurt over and over again. And that's why the pain. And there's something else here too. The human brain, the human brain itself, as you heard already, develops an interaction with the environment. It's not just genetically programmed. So the kind of environment that a child has will actually shape the development of the brain. Now, I can tell you about two experiences with mice. You take a little mouse and you put food in his mouth and he'll eat it and enjoy it and swallow it. But if you put the food down a few inches away from his nose, he will not move to eat it he will actually starve to death rather than eat. Why? Because genetically, they knocked out the receptors for a chemical in the brain called dopamine. Dopamine is the incentive motivation chemical. Dopamine flows whenever we're motivated, excited, vital, vibrant, curious about something, when we're seeking food or a sexual partner. Without the dopamine, we have no motivation. Now, what do you think the addict gets? When the addicts shoot cocaine, the addict shoots crystal meth or almost any drug, they get a hit of dopamine in their brain. And the question is, what happened to their brains in the first place? Because it's a myth that drugs are addictive. Drugs are not by themselves addictive, because most people who try most drugs never become addicted. So the question is, why are some people vulnerable to be addicted? Just like food is not addictive, but to some people it is. Shopping is not addictive, but to some people it is. Television is not addictive, but to some people it is. So the question is, why the susceptibility? There's another little experiment with mice where infant mice, if they're separated from the mothers, will not cry for their mothers. Now, what would that mean in the wild? It means that they would die, because only the mother protects the child's life and nurtures the child. And why? Because genetically, they knocked out the receptors, the chemical binding sites in the brain, for endorphins. And endorphins are our indigenous morphine-like substances. Endorphins are our own natural painkillers. And what morphine or what endorphins also do, they make possible the experience of love. They make possible the experience of attachment to the parent and the parent's attachment to the child. So these little mice without endorphin receptors in their brains will actually not call for their mothers. In other words, the addiction to these drugs and, of course, the heroin and the morphine, what they do is they act on the endorphin system. That's why they work. And so the question is, what happens to people that they need these chemicals from the outside? Well, what happens to them is when they're abused as children, those circuits don't develop. When you don't have love and connection in your life, uh, when you're very, very young, then those important brain circuits just don't develop properly. And under conditions of abuse, things just don't develop properly, and their brains then are, are susceptible when they do the drugs. Now they feel normal, now they feel pain relief, now they feel love. And as one patient said to me that when I first did heroin, she said, it felt like a warm, soft hug, just like a mother hugging a baby. Now, 
I've had that same emptiness, not to the same degree as my patients. What happened to me? What happened to me is that I was born in Budapest, Hungary in 1944 to Jewish parents, just before the Germans occupied Hungary. And you know what happened to the Jewish people in Eastern Europe. And I was two months old when the German army moved into Budapest, the Wehrmacht, and the day after they did, my mother phoned the pediatrician and, and she said, would you please come and see Gabor, because he's crying all the time. And the pediatrician said, of course I will come to see him, but I should tell you, all my Jewish babies are crying. Now why? What do babies know about Hitler or genocide or, or war? Nothing. What we're picking up on is the stresses and the terrors and the depression of our mothers. And that actually shapes the child's brain. That actually shapes the child's brain. And, uh, of course, uh, what happens then is I get the message that the world doesn't want me. Because if my mother's not happy around me, she must not want me. Why do I become a workaholic later? Because if they don't want me, at least they're going to need me. Now I'll be an important doctor, and they're going to need me. And that way I can make up for the feeling of not being wanted in the first place. And what does that mean? It means that I'm working all the time, and when I'm not working, I'm consumed by buying music. What message do my kids get? My kids get the same message that they're not wanted. And this is how we pass it on. We pass on the trauma, and we pass on the suffering unconsciously from one generation to the next. So obviously, there are many, many ways to fill this emptiness. And for each person, there's a different way of filling the emptiness. But the emptiness always goes back to what we didn't get when we were very small. What we didn't get when we were very small. And then we look at the drug addict. And we say to the drug addict, how can you possibly do this to yourself? How can you possibly inject this terrible substance into your body that may kill you? But look at what we're doing to the earth. Rejecting all kinds of things into the atmosphere and the, and the oceans and the environment that is killing us, that's killing the earth. Now, which addiction is greater? The addiction to oil or to consumerism? Which causes the greater harm? And yet, we judge the drug addict because we actually see that they're just like us, and we don't like that. So we say, you're different from us. You're worse than we are. <laughs> On the plane to uh, Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, I was reading the New York Times on June the 9th, and there was an article about Brazil. And the article was about a man called Nigio Gomes, uh, a leader of the Guarani people in the Amazon, who was killed last November. And you probably heard about him. And he was killed because he was protecting his people from the big farmers and companies that are taking over the rainforest and destroying the rainforest and they're destroying the habitat of the native Indian people here in Brazil. And I can tell you that coming from Canada, the same thing has happened over there. And many of my patients were actually First Nations Indian people, native Indian people in Canada. And they are heavily addicted. They make, us, us, they make up a small percentage of the population, but they make up a large percentage of the people in jail, the people who are addicted, the people who are mentally ill, the people who commit suicide. Why? Because the lands were taken away from them and because they were killed and abused for generations and generations and generations. But the question I ask is, if you can understand the suffering of these native people and how that suffering makes them seek relief from pain in their addictions, what about the people who are perpetrating it? What are they addicted to? Well, they're addicted to power. They're addicted to wealth. They're addicted to acquisition. They want to make themselves bigger. And when I was trying to understand the addiction to power, I looked at some of the most powerful people in history. I looked at Alexander the Great. I looked at Napoleon. I looked at Hitler, I looked at Genghis Khan, I looked at Stalin. It's very interesting when you look at these people. First of all, why did they need power so much? Interestingly enough, physically they were all very small people. My size. <laughs> or smaller, actually smaller. They um, came from outsiders. They were not part of the major population. Stalin was a Georgian, not a Russian. Napoleon was a Corsican, not a Frenchman. Alexander was a Macedonian, not a Greek. 
And Hitler was an Austrian, not a, not a German. So a real sense of insecurity and inferiority. And they needed power to feel okay in themselves, to make themselves bigger. And in order to get that power, they're quite willing to fight wars and to kill a lot of people, uh, just to maintain that power. I'm not saying that only small people can be power-hungry, but it's interesting to look at these examples, because power, the addiction to power, is always about the emptiness that you try and fill from the outside. And Napoleon, even in exile, on, on the island of St. Helena, after he lost power, he said, I love power. I love power. He, he couldn't think of himself without power. He had no sense of himself without being powerful externally. And that's very interesting when you compare it to uh, people like the Buddha or Jesus. Because if you look at the story about Jesus and Buddha, both of them were tempted by the devil. And one of the things that the devil offers them is power, earthly power. And they both say no. Now, why do they say no? They say no because they have the power inside of themselves. They don't need it from the outside. And they both say no because they don't want to control people, they want to teach people. They want to teach people by example and by soft words and by wisdom, not through force. So they refuse power. And it's very interesting what they say about that. Jesus says that the power and the reality is not outside of yourself, but inside, he says, the kingdom of God is within. And the Buddha, before he dies, and his monks are mourning and crying and they're all upset, he says, don't mourn me, he says, and don't worship me. Find a lamp inside yourself. Be a lamp unto yourselves. Find the light within. And so as we look at this difficult world with the loss of the environment and the global warming and the depredations in the oceans, Let's not look to the people in power to change things, because the people in power, I'm afraid to say, are very often some of the emptiest people in the world. And they're not going to change things for us. We have to find that light within ourselves. We have to find the light within communities and with our, in our own wisdom, in our own creativity. We can't wait for the people in power to make things better for us, because they're never going to, not unless we make them. Now, They say that human nature is competitive, that human nature is aggressive, that human nature is selfish. It's just the opposite. Human nature is actually cooperative. Human nature is actually generous. Human nature is actually community-minded. What we see here at this conference with people sharing information, people receiving information, people committed to the better world, that's actually human nature. And what I'm saying to you is, if we find that light within, if we find our own nature, then we'll be kinder to ourselves and we'll also be kinder to nature. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.